I know academia very well. And even though my lab is, you know, vastly shrunk now, I still have a lab, I still teach. Despite what you might read on the internet, still a professor at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> still, last time I checked, which is, you know, a few days ago, they called me. Uh, still very involved. After more than a month of silence, Andrew Huberman has finally come out on the record to talk about the allegations that came uh, out about him in New York Magazine. And I wanted to spend a little time reacting to the video. And, you know, the, the, the podcast was very long, uh, two and a half hours almost. Uh, and they spent about 13 minutes talking specifically about um, the allegations of, you know, bad science, uh, the multiple affairs. And I wanted to get, to reduce it all for you so you can see it and uh, give my reactions. So he starts out by obliquely talking about how his lab at Stanford barely exists, and then it goes from there. The point here is that academics and academia is very insular. Why? Everyone's afraid to rebel. Why? Because anonymous peer review of your grants and papers. Biggest fear, you can't get papers published. How do you get papers published? You need money to fund the product. How do you do it? You write grants. Your grants are reviewed by your peers. Everyone is terrified of upsetting each other. So the party line becomes the line. Very hard to rebel. This is hugely important to who Andrew Huberman is as the podcast rebel uh, of science. And it, it really is about his own credibility. He is the rebel science guy who tells you the truth because it's really hard to go against mainstream science. It, it's, it's a really sly way of, of putting that out there. And it's not totally untrue because he is sort of a rebel and he sometimes does have interesting things to say, as you'll see in this uh, show. Get independent funding from other sources and they can be a little bit more adventurous, but it is. He does get independent funding uh, from his sponsors. So one of the ways that Andrew Huberman makes his money is by the incredible bounty of sponsors in his podcast. And he makes, according to um, one of his ex-girlfriends who had obviously a lot of interactions with him over the years, uh, Huberman makes between 12 and $20 million a year uh, just from his podcast sponsorship, some of which supposedly uh, he funnels back into his science uh, and we'll get to that a little bit more. And if you want more references, I did this video about Peter Atia and what sponsorships actually look like. It's one of the most it didn't it used to be this way when funding was more readily available, but it, it's one of the most like, yes, communities like yeah, you, you go, you go like rebels are. Uh, it's not really mm -hmm. not really OK. I think maybe that's really important is that he is saying right now that science funding is much harder to maintain. And maybe to some degree, scientists need to look to other avenues to get funding, which can be problematic because sometimes what you trade for access to funding is editorial independence. Breaking the mold among the mold breakers is how it evolves. And I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to happen now in public communication, podcasting, et cetera, because um, it's we're all very different. But I don't know. So, some I feel like we're on the we're on the on the cusp of something. And Huberman has been really really interesting in terms of where he has come from uh, from a basically an a, a, a unknown uh, neuroscientist into one of the most well known science communicators in the world, uh, including you know incredibly favorable coverage in Time Magazine and elsewhere. However, there have been critics. And that's where we go to now. Hey, you mentioned the the internet and all this kind of stuff. You just kind of you just kind of popped up for the first time with some scrutiny, like public scrutiny, an article and stuff like this. What was that? What was that all about? What was that like? Yeah, I mean, we started the podcast in January 2021, and um, so the it grew really quickly. And honestly, like I didn't know it was going to grow quickly. 2020, I was on 2019. I started posting stuff to Instagram. 2020 during the kind of like the peak of the lockdowns. I started going on some podcasts, no book. Very critical, this is a big highlight in uh, Kerry Halley's articles that uh, Huberman's rise went uh, dovetail exactly uh, with the beginning of COVID-19 lockdown. He gets his start on Rogan as the guy who goes against 
mainstream science. Um, after he appeared on Rogan, uh, he, he quickly jumped into a top 100 podcast. Maybe he was in like the top 10 podcasts. This was a time when everyone was looking for different types of science, different ways of thinking about problems uh, in the world and you know how to treat COVID infections. No nothing, just trying to give people health tools and teach them some science. We launched in January 2021 and just whoosh, just kind of took off. And um, kind of figured like sooner or later, you know, you, you start taking, you, you know, you start getting some criticism. I think the first thing that happened that um, prior to that was people started to supplements. You know, people were like, oh, it's a supplement thing. You know, it's kind of obvious. You have sponsors that makes the podcast free so that you don't pay wallet. So it's available to everybody. I happen to like supplements a lot. I've been taking them since I was in high school. It's interesting that he is able to say that his sponsors are what enables him to give his free science advice. I mean, there are lots of podcasts in the world, Dr. Rondra Patrick comes to mind, who don't take sponsors because they realize it influences their message to the world. What Andrew Huberman is saying right here is that he gives you his free podcast because he is able to sell $20 million of, of sponsorship ads, which is made way more than he can get just from like YouTube views. Uh, from, from you. Um, that's not a service to you. That is a service to him. He just found a better way to monetize it than just getting your eyeballs. It's, it's a weird bait and switch, but continue. It's cool. And I've benefited from them a lot. And I understand that they are different than um, stuff that is, you know, from randomized control trials. You know, oftentimes there's not a ton of testing of the different things, but anyone who uses the right ones can tell you like, okay, there's something there and they may or may not choose to do it. Depends on disposable income, interest, et cetera. But they're not the foundation of like what we teach in the podcast. It's almost all behavioral tools, information. All right, maybe that's just not accurate at all. I mean, supplements are, you know, if you, if you look an article after article after article um, that is uh, about Huberman talking about his supplement regimens, um, most of this stuff is, is actually useless. Um, Vox just did a piece like yesterday uh, about how many of the, the protocols that he has for sale, and he will sometimes spend 20, 30, 40 minutes talking about supplement protocols before he talks about um, cold exposure and sun and these other, these other behavioral things um, that he does. To, so to say that, it, that he doesn't, you know, you, you do have an option not to buy it, but he doesn't care about what you, one individual non-buyer does. He cares about the people who do buy it. I mean, it shouldn't, that should be very clear. First wave, that kind of hit. And when that happened, I was kind of like, eh, well, these people look like they could use a few supplements. Just kidding. Um, what I, what I thought was, listen, if you want to take them, they can take them. And if they don't, they, they don't. Like the information's free. It allows it to be free. Yeah. Advertisements by their nature are free because you are what they're saying. Your eyeballs are what are being sold. It's, it's, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's greenwashing. That's the equivalent of greenwashing. He's saying that the thing that he gets paid for is a benefit to you because he's not being unduly influenced. That's, it, he has it completely backwards. And I think part of this is actually because Huberman um, doesn't have any media training. Um, he's a, he's a, a scientist and he just thinks that the internet and what it's doing and the way people make on the internet is ethically not problematic, which is just not true. Yeah, the, uh, the, the recent stuff was interesting because it was, you know, in many ways, it could have just been titled like, you know, Andrew Huberman is a bad person <laughs> because, um, because it, it really like sought to really just like undermine every aspect of like who I am, mm -hmm. you know, and who I know myself to be and who my friends know me to be. Um, you know, this idea that like, okay, my backstory or whatever, you know, it's like, listen. So we skipped this whole skateboarding segment and what he's really saying, um, you know, right before this is that we have this tendency on the internet to go from treasure to trash. Someone is always all good or all not. I mean, and he's correctly noting that that is a terrible way to think of humans, right? We are all flawed individuals. We have good things, we have bad things about us. And, and honestly, a lot of what Huberman does present on his podcast is actually good science. It's this mix and matching of not good science in with that, which is actually what the problem is. If you, if, if Huberman said 80% of what he said was, was perfect and good and 20% was just horrible, 
Well, actually, in some ways, that's even more problematic. And I think that's where, where one of the reasons why I am so critical of him is that he, he's such a blend that it becomes dangerous for people who take everything that he says um, seriously. It's weird. I mean, I think when you take a step back and go, okay, like what generates clicks, right? Um, it's rarely like, oh, this podcast is doing really well. Time Magazine had done a really nice piece, which had balance in it. Uh, the Time Magazine piece, which he says is balanced, uh, was most other people just recognize as a fawning, entirely pro-Huberman um, story, which was was not balanced. It was basically saying that he is the reason why people care about science now. Or they, you know, kind of, um, you know, touched on how the podcast was really making an effort to teach science and and also health and health and also science. Um, this was that's not balance. Just saying the good story is not balance. Balance is is talking about the whole picture. It's not that they interviewed an ex girlfriend of mine who was super awesome. She actually we met here in San Diego in supporting me. And then of course, you know there was some um, assertions about me and uh, my character. And that's where it gets down to this thing, where it's like, look, I mean, we as humans are complicated. We do some things right. We make mistakes. But to ascribe a t intention to like why people do things like that was the part where I thought like, you know, they're like, you know, they sort of tried to tie like dopamine neurobiology to protocols in the podcast to like <laughs> some diabolical, like even the cover photos, like diabolical, like controlling mastermind. Listen, I'm just trying to get. Through. Okay. This is a critical point because what Huberman has done is really, you know, we shouldn't care about his personal life because, our, our, you know, per, there is a reason why we have private lives, why we don't expose everything about, you know, what we do behind closed doors to the world. However, to think that your private life doesn't also play a role in your public one is, I think, the heart of this overall conflict. It's maybe a conflict that we're having all over the internet, not just about Huberman, but about, like, everyone is that who you are as a as a human being plays out in everything you do and these sponsorships are really important and when we see pseudoscience on the Huberman podcast when he presents things that are not accurate stems from personal things that go way back in their own history so to say that his personal life is irrelevant is just not right. It's not accurate. And it hides the fact and it protects him. It says that I can say whatever I want in public. And if you want to talk to me only in private, that's the, the honorable thing to do. But then that enables him to say whatever he wants in public, uh, which is very manipulative. Through a week. <laughs> like I'm, I'm pretty squared away on the order of a day or a week. I'm thinking next episode. There's no, there was no, and there's never been any master plan to do anything except one thing. Like I genuinely, I think he's right here, actually. I don't think Huberman has had a master plan about how to control and manipulate people. I do think that it is a tactical thing. Every day he is making decisions to do the next thing. And that's where personality is so interesting because the personality controls his short-term thinking. It's an excellent point that he's making here. The only, like, I know this in my heart, is that my desire has always been to put valuable information into the world that people can benefit from and to do it at zero cost and to do that to the best of my ability. Right. Again, zero cost to whom? Zero cost to the viewer who's basically watching 30 or 40 minutes of advertisement. Remember, zero cost to you means you are the product, not the consumer. And, and also to do the most amount of good and the least amount of harm in life, in all aspects of life. And of course, this is true of everyone. I've never met a true villain who actually actively wants to hurt people. I've interviewed organ traffickers. I've interviewed mafia bosses. I've interviewed uh, uh, you know warlords in, 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 in war torn countries, and and no one thinks of themselves as a bad person. In fact, they shouldn't because. Good intentions are what actually leads to these bad outcomes. So although he may feel like he's a good person, let us look at how this the public facing side of what he does alters the science and alters the things that you get as a consumer. Again, I don't really care about his personal life except for how his personal life plays out in his public one. Of course, you know, nobody's perfect and I certainly am not. Um, and, you know, there was, if I'm going to just be direct about it, I mean, I think... 
there are a couple of things. One is, first of all, like there is no version of me or life where like I'm validating or supporting behavior that is common but not good, right? I think that was something to kind of be born out of that. Like, oh, you know, I have six girlfriends. Okay, look, I've had... Okay, it is good that he is admitting fault in these personal things. I, I mean, that's very, that is responsible. Um, and, you know, it, it, this is sort of like the first part where he almost sounds like he's, you know, admitting that there were that were problems and he's modeling bad behavior where all these people were saying, Huberman has these life hacks to let you get as much tail as you want. Um, it's it's nice that he's sort of stepping in into the into the line there. Um, this next part, though, how he defines a girlfriend, I, I do believe is a little a little problematic. Challenge is maintaining one girlfriend. OK, I think we can talk about this a little bit more, but this is where it gets to the importance of defining the relationship and what what a relationship, you know, that's an important label, right? I mean, girlfriends of mine have met my family. We spend time together, you know, that met their families. We, that's a girlfriend, right? So it's not what he says to these women, convincing them that he's in a monogamous relationship with them. It's he has now created new terms on which that they should have understood what monogamy really meant to him, which is not. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, this is, he, he's defending himself in a very strange way here. You know, uh, he, he was lying to people. He was lying. He should just say he was lying. Okay. Doesn't mean that other people are insignificant. It just means it's a different nature of relationship. But I would never want to value. I also think it's important to know that if someone is willing to lie to a lover, uh, who else are they willing to lie to? Validate or support like cheating, right? Listen, I've been cheated on. It sucks. It sucks. I've cheated on people and, uh, and that sucks. Do you think he has cheated on more women or more women have cheated on him? Comments down below. And so I would never, ever, and especially now because I'm saying it, want to validate or support that as a success, right? Like Good. That, Good. that represents failure. Cheating represents failure, not success. That's clear. But it's not just failure, right? It's failure of what? Failure of character. Failure of many things. Is he saying it's a failure of the relationship? Is this on the woman? Is this on him? What is he really saying? Important is I think like we have to all, all be careful about not pathologizing behavior. And how do we pathologize behavior? We give people labels. We call them sociopaths or we decide or non-clinically appointed people to say, oh, that's a narcissist or that's gaslighting or something like that. Okay, so I don't have a clinical um, degree. Uh, I do, I have spoken to people with clinical degrees about Huberman and he seems to fit a type called grandiose um, psychopathy. Um, I do believe that anyone should have the right to tell about their experiences with someone. Like you have an opinion because you have experienced something that is valid. You should be able to make um, qualitative decisions and opinions and form those things about people you interact with. I, I, I do not actually see the problem with that. Uh, it, it sounds like he's, he, he doesn't like other people analyzing him. I mean, to some degree, who wants to be analyzed? Well, you're a public figure. I think, you know, one of the great things about human beings is that we can look at ourselves, we can look at others, and we can try and take understanding and accountability and try and do that without, you know, self-flagellating or flagellating other people because only then is there a chance of people changing their behavior. Mm -hmm. How does someone take accountability for their actions in the public if the, if the conversation does not happen in the public. I think that Huberman really wants to see this as, as, as a personal attack on him without acknowledging the fact that he is a very public figure and that personal decisions and personal um, choices play out in a public sphere. It, it's a fascinating conversation because this actually happens I mean, it's right across the internet. Who are we in public? Who are we in private? And how do those influence one another? And I understand that he's very upset that these details of his embarrassing private life have come out and they have sort of tarnished a, a, an element of his reputation. And that, to some degree, is very tawdry. It's, it, it, it's sensational, but character does matter. 
So where, how do we draw that line? I think that sort of when you become a public figure, that is one of the things that you unfortunately give up because if you if you want to talk about a public figure's actions and their effect on the world, you sort of have to go into their private lives. So, you know, those, you know, that whole thing, you know, some of it, I just went, it's like, what? Like, you know, being uh, the, probably one of the most, I just had to like literally laugh out loud. It's like that I doted on my bulldog excessively. <laughs> Listen, if you want to know somebody's heart, look at how they treat their animals. <laughs> you know, look at, I mean, it's, it actually runs counter current to the clinical diagnosis of sociopathy, which they also sort of like alluded to, right? Uh, there is actually no clinical diagnosis for sociopathy. It's not in the DSM. Uh, there are uh, related disorders, but it's, it's, it's actually not there. It, anyway, go on. I love animals. So, you know, um, to be... And he did absolutely love Costello. There's no doubt. He criticized or kind of poked at for like, you know, making sure that my bulldog Costello was tucked in. Like, hey, he liked being tucked in with his blanket, you know? And uh, I love seeing him comfortable. And uh, like, you know, it like, it, and it broke my heart to see him cold or like, you know? And like, I mean, I have only two words for anyone that has a problem with how well I took care of my dog. And I'm not gonna be, you know, I think the scientific um, explanation is fuck you. <laughs> I actually, I think that's really, he made a, a point here, which is rhetorical and, and really good. So I actually looked up that article um, and looked up that section in the article. And it, it was about him doting on a dog and putting his blanket on the dog. Uh, but the context of that quote is actually super important because in the paragraph just prior to it, it talks about Huberman flying off the hook and just um, for hours, you know, all like three or four hours at night, and then again in the morning, yelling at his girlfriend, who was named Sarah in the um, article and is, has a, a different real name, uh, and, and how he was furious at her. And, and I think the reason that that contrast was in the article is like, look, he's mean to his, his, the, the, the person he's supposedly in love with, the human, and he dotes upon his dog. So it's not, the, the article wasn't saying that he shouldn't be doting on his dog or he hates animals. The, the argument in the article was that he was, uh, you know, borderline abusive to his, his girlfriend verbally screaming off the handle, which is something I've seen in Huberman as well, when he flew at me off the handle and threatened to sue me and threatened me uh, over the phone. It, he was doing this to other person. So he's, he's cherry picking a piece of evidence and then, and then saying that that's what the whole article was about. And then, you know, and, and then comes laughter. <laughs> Keegan was one of his girlfriend who he was with uh, at the time when I was uh, I met him first in, in Oakland. And then <laughs> met my my, you know, then girlfriend, Keegan, who was kind enough in that, you know, it was interesting that the these these media things, you know, that they there's a data selection in terms of what's emphasized. But she she very, um, you know, graciously reported we had a, we had a pretty awesome relationship of. He did not say nice things about Keegan to me uh, when we had met. He, he, he said very, very mean things. Um, you know, calling her crazy was the low end of that stuff. Eventually, um, we parted ways and uh, I got my own place off Bibon Ave in Oakland and um, was commuting and doing the academic thing. And you're just working. And traveling the world, like working like a maniac. I've always worked like somewhere mm -hmm. between like 70 and 80, sometimes 100 hours a week. Sometimes I throttle back. Now it's, you know, a little more segmented. But yeah, then, you know, 2021 start the podcast and all of a sudden it's like, whoa. Like, I didn't, I like when I put stuff out into the world, it's, it's I mean, this is what's also so, I think, important. All right, so I, I think this is, again, really interesting because remember, prior to all of this, prior to COVID, Huberman was an unknown. Like he was an, an, a, like, you know, not, not a nobody. He was still a professor at Stanford. Um, but he, his fame, I think it surprised him as much as it surprised um, everyone else. And for people to understand about these online things and media and all this, and we could talk about this a lot if you want, is that it's like a one-way conversation in many ways, but then you're like catching it back through a fire hose, right? <laughs> so you have to, it, you, you do develop a really thick skin. Definitely true. I have an enormously thick skin. If you want to look in the comments down below, half the people hate me, maybe more. Right, you know, you, you, people are going to say stuff. You know, I think that... Um, but, but it's also the, the one-way conversation part of this is what sort of fame is. You, you, 
the public figure speaks out to the audience, uh, and you the it feels like he shouldn't have repercussions, but then the audience and and other journalists and people who want to fact check him do want to respond. So where is that conversation supposed to happen? It's very different than a one on one conversation, and um, and to just also like make sure that I'm rounding the corners on what we were just talking about. Like I understand that. N- you know, my podcast isn't for everybody. It's kind of long winded. It gets down into the weeds, although we have some shorter content coming, some 30 minute audio only summary type stuff that I'm hoping people will will enjoy if the other stuff's too long. But, you know, it's, I understand because I grew up intentionally doing different, looking different, acting different because it was what was in my heart that people are not going to like it. And I also understood that there are people that are going to like it. And I also understood that in a couple of years, People kind of. But the problem with misinformation is not whether someone likes it or not. In fact, usually there's lots of research on this. Lying will get you people to like you more because if you tell them what they want to hear, they will appreciate you. But that's not what truth is. Truth, especially scientific truth, can be inconvenient. And he's conflating popularity with credibility here. And I, I, that is, it's not just his problem, it's an internet problem. And, and, and he was going to get into later into the problems of the internet. He's actually gonna nail some things perfectly because it's the problems with Huberman are not only the problems of Huberman, the problems of Huberman are the problems of fame and problems of the internet. And it's all wrapped in together. Drift towards it. And by then we're already on to the next thing. And that frustrates the hell out of everybody. It frustrates the hell out of everybody, but we don't do it intentionally, right? There isn't, again, there's no diabolical plan. <laughs> you know, it's, I once saw a quote that of Rogan. I, I, maybe it's accurate, maybe it's not, but he, he described himself as like the fish that got through the net. That there's no on, you know, he, he's just being himself. Mm-hmm. There's something so refreshing to people just being themselves. It's true. What does make someone famous and someone not? Like Rogan is just fine. He's sort of chill and he has good guests. But like, what is it that makes someone famous? And then what is the responsibility of the famous person once they're famous? Like, can you just... It, like, is there, does great power come great responsibility? Is, is that what happens? Or do you just get fame and then you can, then, then you, you, you own it and you can do whatever you want? I think that the world sort of wants fame is people to do whatever they want and get a free pass. I don't think that's what our actual responsibility is because we do have a responsibility to the community in the world. And there's a, a conversation that happens between the audience and the, and the, and the podcaster. But when you are someone like Huberman and your, credi- and, and your credibility is based on your Stanford science and your, if your science doesn't check out, and, and for anyone who thinks that I haven't done reporting on his science, there's quite a bit. I have a whole playlist about Huberman and where we go into his science and you should check out videos where I, I critique very, very specific things um, that he says which are very misleading and in some cases potentially dangerous. And I think that... Um... So for me, I'll put stuff out into the world and I'm not thinking about like, are they gonna like it? Are they not gonna like it? I'm just doing the best I possibly can. And of course I make mistakes. Like this is the funny thing, like the idea that- And, 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 and part of me here just really actually sympathizes with Huberman now because, because as a person coming onto the internet, and saying things, you, 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 we all make, I make mistakes, he remember makes mistakes and everything else, but, but the consequences of those mistakes get bigger when your platform gets bigger. And how do we reckon with that as a society? That's really the ultimate conversation that we're having here. Because if Huberman only had five followers on, on his Instagram profile, no one would care. So fame is a salient thing that we need to think about. And it's sort of not what he's addressing. Like. I saw some headlines that were kind of derivative headlines or like, you know, the, the falling of like Mr. Perfect, like what? Like (laughs) anyone that knows me and that's close to me knows, like I've said it before on Lex's podcast. I'm like, I'm replete with flaws because I'm a human being and I'm always trying to do the best I can. And if like someone has an issue with me and they want to talk about it one-on-one, I will absolutely every time. If he is replete with flaws and he puts them out publicly, 
shouldn't that be part of a public conversation, right? You've put your, your podcast out publicly. It is now a conversation. There are flaws in it. For instance, bad science. I'm talking about ice bathing, the stuff that he did with Susanna Soberg, um, uh, the, the, his supplement protocols, his, his, his uh, misinformation on sugar, you know, lots of stuff like that. He's saying that it, it goes out publicly, but when you deal with it, when you, when, you, when you want to critique it, you have to do it in private in a conversation where uh, uh, having actually talk to him privately, he controls that conversation. He wants control over everything. And in that conversation, he you know, went with me, just like what he did with uh, Sarah from the article. He yelled at me and he threatened to sue me and he said I was violating national security and, and he, he was apoplectically mad. And you know, Huberman's a big guy who's used to bullying people in, 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 in private. So he's saying, Deal with him on his own terms in private when there's a critique, but in public, you need to fawn over him. It's, it's not fair. I won't do my best to work that out with them. Now, it's not an interpersonal problem. It's a problem with the communication to millions of people. How do you deal with that? You deal with it publicly. When things are getting vetted publicly, that's a whole different business because now it's a, it's a dialogue that you can't control and it's, People can say whatever they want, they can put whatever labels, and then you have to understand the incentive schemes too, which is that they're trying to sell clicks and they're trying to get their angst out. And, and is he saying that he is not trying to sell clicks? Is he saying that he, um, that, that he is outside of the economics of the world with his $20 million, the 12 to $20 million he makes selling supplements and, and other things to his audience? How is he saying that, that, the, that the journalists who, who talk about his problems in his podcast are, are, are incentivized by money, but he is not being incentivized by money? People are resentful or people love you and people hate you. And I think we were talking about this before, like here's, here's my, my thesis these days. And I, I've talked to a couple legitimate psychiatrists, psychologists. This is his internet diagnosis. And so far it's, you know, three for three. The internet and social media in particular is borderline. <laughs> borderline, <laughs> borderline not, personality not disorder. bipolar. This, I mean, honestly, this is actually Andrew Huberman at his best. He's right about this. He's, he, this whole section right here, he's, he's right but borderline borderline means literally weaving back and forth across the line from healthy logical sane to psychotic it's either projecting at you love and adoration or it's projecting hate and vitriol and you can't control which one it's going to be so when you go, when i go online now i'm like okay i'm going on x which i enjoy <laughs> i really like x i don't know why maybe because i like a little bit of a scrap get in there and it's like it's borderline you're gonna yeah. get psychotic stuff. You're gonna get sane stuff. There's some smart people. There's some dumb people. There's, you know, but that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a borderline organism. And he is absolutely right. Like this, is, it's a conversation that happens on the internet and the internet is vitriolic. It's polarized which is why I try to present nuanced arguments and no one can deal with nuance on the internet because we have to go from treasure to trash. There's actually a lot of great things about Andrew Cuberman, which is why I wrote about him in my book, The Wedge, which is why I actually think he has a fascinating mind and, 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 and so curious and, 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 and also in, in some ways considerate too. Like, like he's Honestly, a very, very good intellectual, but I think what happened is he got so famous that he doesn't understand the responsibilities of being famous, and, it's, and he doesn't understand his position in the world, and he wants it to be simpler. He wants to not have a complex uh, situation. He wants to take the benefits, but not take the critiques. And, you know, I don't know who said this, but, you know, the larger the group, the lower the level of consciousness. Somebody said that, not me. Mm. Seems um, good. Just repeating it. So I think when, you, when you're out facing or even if you're just on the internet you got to know what you're dealing with you gotta know but i would hope that if you isn't that the thing how if he, he is a public figure he has to know how he's on the internet it's not a private conversation he's having a public conversation and so he's dealing with with the repercussions of that which involve his private life you or you ever had an issue with me that you call me up and you'd be like hey dude you need to get your ass down to san diego we need to have a conversation Let's have that conversation, Andrew Huberman. Let's do it. Take On the internet, name calling is not gonna solve it. 
in person, the way you do it, you sit down, you have a conversation and it hurts. And I will say, how do you solve the problem of misinformation with a personal conversation? Andrew, you, you might be watching this. I'd love to actually have that conversation with you. I've tried actually on a, on a few occasions and was sort of rebuffed um, when you told me that you there that what you're doing is totally fine. Right now and for the record and forever, I'm always open to having private one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to resolve things. If the goal, I wonder if you would call if if we could talk again. I wonder. Goal is resolution, or people can like keep pain in their hearts and move forward. You don't always get that opportunity, and that's sad to me. Or but, you can let yeah. that pain out on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, or 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 you can or you can leverage other things to try and get it out. But I don't know. I anyway. The point is this: is Yeah, how do we raise the issue with Huberman in a way that's constructive? Because you know, for years people have been talking about the problem of misinformation on his podcast. You know, I started when I when I did this the, this piece on how his shiver protocol in ice bathing was really weird, and with Susanna Soberg and the brown fat stuff, and those conversations go out to a, a minuscule audience, legitimately very very tiny audience, and and no one seems to pay attention. They just keep on um, supporting the popular guy, and it's it's disheartening that that the the story that is salacious, the sex stuff, then that controls the narrative. And honestly, it's not the most important thing, but his character part is important in this. Uh, and it's, it's really, really hard to make that balance between what gets the clicks and what people need to actually understand about the situations that are going on. Um, you know, there was a Vox piece that just came out a few days ago about, um, you know, his pseudoscience that's probably gonna go nowhere because people only care where his wandering penis may or may not have gone. And, and you know, I guess maybe to some degree I'm guilty of this is that I'm trying to, to raise awareness of the science uh, issues by also talking about the things that people will pay attention to. Uh, and, 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 and those are, it, it's, it, I, I do see them as related, but the science part is so much more important. But if you look at a video of mine that has uh, most, the most views, it's the one that only, that made, basically talks about the interpersonal relationships. Uh, when, when we're trying to raise awareness on the public, it's a, it's a, it's a fraught situation. It's like, I, I have certain patterns in me that I'm sure are healthy, certain patterns in me that are unhealthy. Of course, like I'm always trying to reflect, like that's just who I am. I'm always trying to reflect on how I can be better and do better. But again, I am replete, look up the word folks, <laughs> with flaws. But I like to think I get certain things done well too. Anyway, I'm going along here on this, but um, if we ever have an issue, just talk to me first, hit me second. <laughs> Got it. I mean, I, I actually really appreciated that he did actually finally address this in publicly. I mean, over the, you know, the first thing that Andrew Huberman did uh, was he hired a, a PR firm to, to AstroTurf um, Reddit and other places by spreading narratives that this was an unfair thing to talk about his personal life in relation to his podcast. Uh, and that, that, that PR firm is called Scale Strategies, and they have like a, this team of, of PR sharks uh, who are trying to manipulate the public opinion. But public opinion was probably already going to go his way anyway because his audience of about 5 million people is passionate about him. And, and part of their passion, and here's the, the hard thing, and part of the passion is that it's well-deserved because Huberman is a great science communicator. Like, he's really, really good at communicating. The problem is that he hasn't been able to separate out the corporate side from the scientific independence side. And it is something that I, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot on the podcast. What is the ethical way to communicate to the world. Taking on sponsors puts you in debt to those sponsors. And when and your customers are, are free and they're just watching you, they're not remunerating, right? You, you don't pay for Huberman's podcast. That means that he has to find a way to monetize your viewership. And over time, and not always, but over time, it gravitates to where he needs more and more eyeballs to keep those sponsorship dollars coming in because who doesn't want $20 million a year? And, and the more shocking the content, the more cutting edge the content, also the less reliable the content 
is. And certainly not everything he says is bad. Like, I also love ice bathing. I also think that getting sunlight in the morning is not is, is good. I also think that it's, it's important to look at science. It's important to actually read and contend with science. And, the, and, and, and Huber and I agree on this. The issue becomes really problematic when so much money is involved and that money influences the way he works. And, and again, I do think that Huberman has, a, you know, this, I'm trying not to say the diagnosis, right? The diagnosis that I have in my head, and again, I'm not a clinician. It's that grandiose psychopathy. I did this other show where I did actually talk to a psychiatrist about, um, psychiatrist, psychologist, anyway, she can, she can give diagnosis, where, where Huberman's personality really does fit that pattern of somebody who is, so attentive to you and yet also so manipulative at the same time. And I do think there's an element of him where he really likes getting into fights. He likes being combative, he likes being in control, and he likes controlling the outcomes for other people. And this has led to some weird sexual situations with his, you know, many, many ladies that he's with, but also friendships that are broken. Like, you know, if you listen to the whole Jocko Wilnick podcast, all of his friends are celebrities. Right? They're all enabling each other in various ways. And I, I, I actually think that a lot of celebrities have really, really messed up priorities in the world because they think that fame is the most important category uh, for worth. And it's not. Um, anyway, that was the re my reaction video to Huberman. I hope you see that I have actually a nuanced feelings on him. And part of me really likes him. And part of me is like horrified by him. And... Um, and maybe one day we'll have a, a conversation because actually it would be sort of interesting to talk with him specifically on these, these issues. I don't know, maybe should I, should I text him? I bet he wouldn't respond.